What's up, Sifus? It's your boy, Kaz, bringing you my full, ultimate, in-depth combat and survival guide. This video is a beast. It is made to jump around, use those bookmarks, find where you need to go, but it has everything. It has everything from just how the game works to in-depth attack and defense guide to thinking about all of those shrine and skill tree upgrades. There is no stone left unturned here. All of these videos are also going to be made into individual videos. If that more lines up with your flow, that's all good. So let's go ahead and jump in. So let's get going with our death and dying guide. This is really just how the game works. The fundamentals of how you age, how you die, what saves and what doesn't. This video is designed for people who have been playing for a while and just want to kind of understand what's going on better and people who are brand new to the game just to get the fundamentals. Let's start by going over the most foundational and fundamental question for this game is, and that's how does death and aging work? So the way this works is every time you die, you add a death to your death counter. So what that means is that when you die and come back, you're going to add the number of your death counter, which is on the right, to your age, which was on the left there. So when you die, you age your death counter. So if your death counter is five, you're gonna age five. If it's two, you're gonna age two, like you're gonna see right here. So when you die, you age your death counter. So every time you age 10 more years, one of these pendants is going to break. And after your last pendant breaks, you'll be over 70. And then your next death will be your last death. So when each pendant breaks after those 10 years and you come back to life, you'll have less health. So you'll die more easily, but your damage will go up. So you'll knock people out more easily too. So that's important to know. What does this mean for you? One of the most frustrating aspects of this game as you grow and learn is you're going to die a lot, and that means you're going to age real fast, but that's okay. I'm going to talk a lot in this video about your mentality and how to approach the game and practice and get real good. Now, some things you can do about it, right? Because the question kind of becomes, okay, so what do I do about it? And the first thing is know that when you defeat mini bosses like this guy in the squats or a big groups oftentimes your death counter will go down just like that so if you space out your deaths and get through some big groups and bosses you're going to have your death counter go down so the big take homes here are of course don't die uh, skill up get better practice a lot uh, so you're not dying as much but if you are going to die just try and space them out get through that big group or that mini boss to get keep that death meter down some other things you can do to just increase your longevity and die less is to upgrade at the shrine. You can see health, you can increase the amount of health you gain on takedowns, which is one of my favorite shrine unlocks and will keep you lasting a bit longer. And then lastly, there's another shrine unlock that costs a thousand XP, so it's expensive, but it will reset your death counter to zero. That can be so good before you're about to go into a boss where you know you're gonna die multiple times or are likely to die multiple times. One last important point for strategizing as you progress through hideouts and age and with death and dying is that some of your shrine upgrades are inaccessible at a certain age. So you can see the max age to unlock health gained on takedowns is 40, weapon durability 25. So you're going to want to plan that. You may want to focus on weapon durability early, knowing you can get to some other shrine upgrades when you get older. The same is true for skill tree unlock. Some become unlockable or you can't continue to add to permanent unlocks as you get older so that's really it for my death and dying guide i hope this has been just kind of an introduction to how the game works but also how you can strategize based on how the game works our next video and section here is all about how the game works with progression what saves and what doesn't and when you should just end a run because you're just dying too much so Let's try and answer the question of what saves permanently and what doesn't. So regardless of where you are in your run, 
if you've gone back to the squats or are restarting at the club, whatever it is, what's going to be there for you? What's going to be there for you in terms of your shrine upgrades, your age, your starting age, things like that. So note that starting age for hideouts permanently safe. So if you get to the club at 20 in a run, you'll always be able to go back to the club and play it at age 20. You have the option to permanently unlock skills in the skill tree. And when you make all those installments and you do permanently unlock it, that's there for you on any run. Wherever you start, you'll always have those uh, skills there for you. But know that you do have to unlock the move each run before more payments. So when you start a run, you always will have to un pay to unlock it. And then you can start making more installment payments to permanently unlock it. Your detective board will permanently save in between runs or if you restart runs. So you never have to worry about that. You'll always have those keys and key cards, etc. One interesting thing about permanent saves and saves between hideouts or shrine upgrades where I think I understand what's going on, but maybe y'all can help me out in the comment section. So of course shrine upgrades are going to continue from hideout to hideout. So if you increase your health gained on takedowns at the squats, you can increase it even more at the club. But it also seems to me, and this is what I need folks help on, is if you have certain shrine upgrades when you get to a hideout on your best run or your lowest age even if you give up you quit you permanently die and then you go start that hideout again those shrine upgrades from your best run or basically your run where you got there with your lowest age will be there so i do think some shrine upgrades permanently save but it's only the ones that are from the run in which you got to that level at your lowest age but that means that you've given up or you completely died and then those shrine upgrades are there for you but let me know what you think in the comments section i'm still a little baffled by this so hopefully you're still sticking with me. And what this means is if you want better shrine upgrades when you enter into the museum, let's say, well, that means you need to go back to the club or go back to the squats, upgrade your shrines as you like, and then you have to still get to the museum at your youngest level or they won't save for you there. So hopefully that tells you what permanently saves. Uh, I know it's a little complicated. We've talked about what permanently saves. We're going to talk about what saves between hideouts on a run. So what I mean by that is what doesn't permanently save as you progress. <clears throat> so before I get into that, let's talk real quick about what's a run again. So a run is when you start wherever you start from and you progress from hideout to hideout. So a full run would be starting with the squats ending at, at the end, right? That would be a full run, but you can start your run from any hideout. And when you start from any hideout or from the squats and start fresh, that's when you're going to have your permanent saves. But there are some things you won't have. So what this means for shrine upgrades is wherever you start your run, you'll have the shrine upgrades from your youngest age when you got to that level. And then as you progress, of course, you'll sort of keep those from one hideout to the next, however you decide to progress. Um, but you have to beat the level at your youngest age and those will be the shrine upgrades that permanently save there. The less complicated thing that doesn't permanently save but does save between hideouts are your skill tree unlocks. So if you unlock chasing trip kick in the club it'll be there of course when you progress to the museum on that run. But if you restart a run, you die or give up, then those unlocked skill trees won't save, they won't permanently save unless you've permanently unlocked them, which I went over a little earlier. So putting this differently, the question is, well, what erases when you start a new run, you die or you give up? And so new runs erase your shrine upgrades unless you had those upgrades when you beat the last hideout at your youngest age. And, of course, it erases anything that's not permanently unlocked in your skill tree. It's a lot. You're doing great. Let's move on to the next thing. So here's what I can figure out if you exit to the main menu or, like, turn off your PlayStation. So what will happen is you can pick right up 
where your last run ended. So if you've gotten to the tower and then you go to the main menu, you'll have the option to continue back at the tower with whatever shrine upgrades and unlocks you have then. That said, if you exit to the main menu in the middle of a hideout, then your progress in that hideout, hideout won't save. So if you exit to the main menu right before you get to Sean at the club, you're gonna have to totally restart the club to get back to Sean. Now that we've talked about how the game works with death and aging, what saves and what doesn't, you may get to this point where you're so old, you're not as far as you'd like to be and you wanna call it quits. So when do you call it quits on a run? Well, the answer is it really depends. If you're still really learning a boss's moves and scouting out, if you're still amassing XP to permanently unlock moves, you're learning a hideout, whatever it is, you should never call it quits. Just keep playing everything as an opportunity to amass XP and to learn the moves of different fighters. Now, if you feel like you've learned everything, you've unlocked all of the moves, then yeah, you might wanna call it quits when you get to a certain age because you're just not where you need to be to beat the game. One rule you can kind of go by is that there's five bosses and five pendants, but ideally early on you're breaking very few pendants and like the squats like no pendants and then maybe you break two as you get towards the end. But that's really it. That's what we think about when we think about progression and when to call it quits. I hope this has helped you think about all of that and thanks for watching. All right, we've laid the foundation in the past videos, so this one's really how to get really good and advance really far. This is a little bit more of a tips video to understand how the fundamentals of the game can work for you, not against you. So that's where we're at for this video. I'm only here for the workout. One of the biggest tips I have for getting really good and advancing really far, and maybe my biggest tip, period, is shifting your early mentality from progression and just trying to beat hideouts and move to the next hideout to one of practicing, scouting, amassing XP, and being okay dying a lot. Now, I don't love giving a, a combat and survival guide that tells you to die a lot, but it's just the way this game is developed. You are going to die a lot. And if your early mentality is just to practice certain moves you get, and as you get new moves, practicing them and scouting, this is the biggest thing, scouting enemies and how they move and how you can get an upper hand. If that's what you're doing early on, honestly, I think I played the squats 15 times before I ever went to the club. And that was all about just getting this game and its combat down. Dying a lot, sure, but even in that learning phase, I got a ton of XP to unlock more skills in the skill tree, which was huge. So yeah, the point is to practice, practice, practice. Practice those skill moves, practice your defense, and I have videos up to Wazoo about attacking and defense so check those out but if again if you go in with the mentality of hey early on this is all about practice and once i feel like i have the game down then i'm going to really worry about progression and beating it so one of the things i really love and that i hope people leave this video thinking more about is how this game is so much about learning the of the fighters different moves so one of the biggest tips for getting really good and advancing really far is just spending a lot of time particularly with bosses knowing you're going to die but scouting their moves when's the best time to do that avoid that's going to open up that window for you to punish them so again early on just scout get timings find the best opportunities and moves to punish part of learning of course is to scout moves and guard and to scout moves trying to get perfect parries or what they call deflecting but all of that being said as you're doing that you also want to experiment with counter moves with what moves seem to be the best for knocking enemies down and then doing beatdowns so it's about scouting and it's also about experimenting with moves that are going to work uh, to do the most damage and as you do this as you play the squats in the club many many times you're going to find that you're amassing, you're getting a lot better at the game, you're not dying as much, and you're amassing a ton of XP on the way. And that leads to mastery, right? You're gonna have all of your moves, you're gonna understand timing, you're not gonna freak out during combat, and all of that will just help you advance really far and get really good. So if all of your practice is being done in hideouts and early on, you might ask the question of when do you use practice mode? Like, what is it good for and why would I use it? Well, the answer to that is pretty much never. I very rarely use practice mode because why not practice and get better 
learning a lot of different kinds of enemies and when you can get XP. So practice at hideouts, y'all. Get used to just dying and being okay dying while you're doing a lot of learning. Now there are some things that can help in practice mode and that is early on to get deflect and avoiding timing because doing this early on will just make it a little easier for you to move through the hideout. So get that deflection, which is like a perfect parry and avoid timing really well. And also when you're first learning a move or weapon, maybe spend like two minutes here just getting the, the move down before you then practice more in a hideout. This is a survival game and thus the game is not very generous with opportunities to regain health. So let's talk about the different ways you can regain health and live longer. So generally speaking, the ways you're gonna regain health are to take out targets. You can do that by doing takedowns, which we'll talk about, or knockouts. So I'll explain that a little bit more. So generally finishing with combos is what I'll refer to as a knockout so you can see here i knocked this guy out with the roundhouse that regains a little bit of health it's not the best way to regain health takedowns which are square and triangle on ps5 those are going to help you earn more health that's the best way to earn health and we'll talk about how you can even get more from shrine upgrades but you can see there in the same run same upgrades i get more health from a takedown that means you really got to maximize and take advantage of your takedown opportunities and so there's a chime, which you'll hear in just a second. That will help you, and also looking out for the square triangle indicator. I did some eyeball comparisons to see if bigger guys and mini bosses give you more health, and it does seem like they give you slightly more, but it's nothing to write home about. The big thing here and the big take home is to keep an eye out for those takedown opportunities and, and really take advantage of them. And for whatever reason you can see it might be kind of inconsistent i didn't get much for a takedown on that mini boss so that's where it is with takedowns there is one other place where you're going to get substantial regaining of health and that's in between the first and second phase of boss fight so you'll see there i was actually quite low on health but here after it after the first phase i'm all the way back to 100 percent health so takedowns are your best bet for regaining health, but you can actually gain more health per takedown with this shrine health gain upgrade where health gained on takedowns increases. So this is arguably my favorite one. It's not a huge difference each time you upgrade it, but again, when death matters so much, getting opportunities to regain life is just massive. Another way to get better and live longer is to spend XP wisely. I'm gonna spend a lot more time on what I think you should spend your XP on in the next video. But the point here is don't leave XP on the table when you die or you're getting close or near to the end of your run because you're getting older. Invest that XP in permanent unlocks. Like do what you can to spend your XP in the smartest way possible. One tip to help you live longer is to remember that you can skip some fighters. The question is, should you? Remember that every level has some fighters you can skip, and you'll survive longer by not fighting everyone. This can be particularly How great because there are some quite difficult food? fighters that you Two can skip. Even get entire scary. rooms you can skip, not even talking about shortcuts yet, that will help you get through a level trial. without aging a lot faster. So there are some circumstances where it's good to skip enemies that are skippable, but that being said, a little XP never hurt anyone. So I would say it kind of depends on what your situation is. If you are still skilling up, getting your skill tree better and better, I don't know why you'd skip fighters. Just go ahead and do it. Get your XP up, practice, scout, all of those kinds of things. No need to skip fighters. Also, another reason not to skip fighters, as you can see here, is before you go in the ring, you'll be able to get some easy takedowns, which will boost your health, get your health maybe back up to 100% before you go into a tougher room or section. So in my opinion, the only times you would skip fighters would be if you're basically maxed out on XP and you're just trying to survive and beat the game. The other reason is you're like pretty much good with the level except for the boss. The boss is giving you a hard time. I would say at that point, you have a lot more scouting to do probably on the next hideout, so why not just skip away, maybe even do some shortcuts to get to the boss so you can scout him out 
and be able to defeat them without fully dying. And then that way you're just going to have better runs because bosses aren't going to stop you dead in your tracks. Pretty much all this applies to shortcuts too. You probably know every level has a shortcut or shortcuts that help you get to the boss faster. The museum in particular, you probably know you can go right to the boss right off the bat. So with that, we need to ask ourselves, should we use these shortcuts? Well, one important aspect of that is knowing that if you do use shortcuts, you're likely to miss anywhere from one to two shrines. And shrine upgrades are critical, in my opinion, to be able to beat the game in, in one run. So I would say shortcuts, again, are really good when you need to scout the boss um, and you need to survive, which we'll talk about in a second. But you, again, you need to ask yourself, is XP and practicing and scouting the mentality in the place I'm at right now because I'm still pretty new to the game. In that case, I just don't shortcut. Just go through the motions every time you're going to get more XP and get way more practice than rehearse. And then when you are going to use those shortcuts or again when you're trying to survive and have a great run through the entire game or when you're boss scouting, those are good opportunities to use shortcuts. But even that, I don't use all of them because I want to use those shrine upgrades. So that's what you need to know about everything regarding how to be better and live longer. Our next section and video is making the most of XP. So this is all about how to get XP, how to farm XP if such a thing exists, how to spend your XP, and how to spend it wisely on shrine upgrades and skill tree upgrades. So XP is essential to survival. You need to be smart with it in order to survive long and beat this game. So what I want to do in this video is just kind of go, how are we going to get as much XP as possible? and what shrine upgrades and what skill tree upgrades are the best use of your XP dollars. This tip is so important in terms of earning and farming XP, but also just in general, it bears repeating. Keep your early mentality, your early mindset, as the point is to practice, scout, gain XP, and you're probably gonna die a lot. So I probably did the squats 20 times before I even touched the club. And that was just to learn the game, learn the controls. And in doing that, I got a ton of XP and unlocked a lot of permanent upgrades that I then was able to bring into the club and every hideout was easier because of it. I touched a little bit on this in the last video, but another way you can make sure you're maximizing and getting the most out of XP or farming XP is to not skip fighters. There are rooms and fighters that you can skip, but if you're practicing and just trying to earn XP, which is so important early on, just don't skip any fighters. Moving on, let's touch upon the ways that you earn XP. Like what are the things you do in Sifu that actually earn you XP? And as you can imagine, mostly it's doing damage and finishing guys. So I found that maybe with certain moves or after you do a certain amount of damage to a fighter, you're going to get XP and all your finishing moves and takedowns are going to earn you XP as well. Now that we've established how you earn XP, let's talk about how you make the most of your multiplier. You've probably noticed on the right hand part of your screen or your HUD is a times two times three times four times five. And this is how many times the number of XP points you get based on your multiplier. The way to get your multiplier up is to do certain amounts of damage and finishers that can be takedowns or it can be just finishing moves that knock out enemies. That Those are the things that are gonna increase your multiplier. If you take damage, it will bring it down. Not all at once, not every single piece of damage is gonna bring it all the way from a five to a zero. But generally, the more damage you take, the further it's gonna go down and it does go down quite quickly. So what you wanna do is also know that avoiding so L1 on PlayStation 5 and moving your left joystick or avoiding is going to increase your multiplier as well. The highest that your multiplier goes is times five. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't go higher than that. Another important thing to know that I've tested out a little bit is that your multiplier typically lasts in between rooms or sections. So you can have a times five at the end of say a mini boss and then you'll move to the next uh, fighter 
like you'll see in this video, and that times five is still continuing. I don't know exactly how long it lasts, but it seems to last a while. The amount of XP you can get is as little as 10 from taking down one just sort of run-of-the-mill guys all the way up to 1500 plus for taking out a boss. So that's just from the, what little I looked at it. It's just good to know that as you navigate the hideouts. Also note that there's no multiplier against bosses that I've noticed, so you're not gonna get any more than like the final award for XP that you get with bosses. I know there's always a lot of interest in farming XP, particularly early on, so I do wanna touch upon those, but of course, as you can imagine, most of the farming XP advice is just playing the game and getting really good at it by practicing and getting timing down and things like that. But one tip I have for farming XP early is just to play the squats a lot early on because it's, you know, the easiest level, but there's tons of XP to be learned, especially as you skill up, get better, get the timing you're gonna have a times five multiplier a lot in this level when you're really good or as you're getting really good. And so you're gonna farm a ton of XP and you're gonna get better at the game just by running the squats a lot. Get really good with avoid. This is arguably the most important skill in the entire game, especially with bosses. You just wanna practice your avoid and get your avoid down because it's gonna increase your multiplier. It's gonna help you be better at this game, period. And so those are some of the ways that you can farm XP. I'll say this though, that this game is, in my opinion, is so fun. Getting really technically good at it, if you focus on that and don't worry so much about dying, particularly early on, you're gonna find yourself with a wealth of XP. I think I was all the way to the museum and I was already maxed out with all of my skill upgrades. So I wasn't worried too much about XP because I invested so much time in practicing by doing the first two hideouts a lot all right well that's really everything with that i think you need to know about xp but of course leave any questions or comments and i'll try and get to them thanks so much all right y'all next is our shrines and skill tree upgrade guide this is really making sure you have all the information you need to make the best decisions when you're upgrading your skill moves at the skill tree and shrines uh, throughout your hideouts so Let's start by just making sure you all know, typically there are three shrines per hideout. One hideout has four. But that being said, the important thing to know is that you only are gonna have about three opportunities per hideout to upgrade at a shrine. And you can only make one upgrade per shrine. So that's important to know because XP, your score for the hideout, and age all determine what upgrades you can and cannot make at a shrine. As I said in the last section, shortcutting can bypass one, two, or even, yeah, I think two shrines at the most. So you wanna be careful about if that's what you wanna do. Shrines are so important to be able to beat this game. So it's kind of a trade-off. Do you take a shortcut, get to the boss faster, but not have opportunities to upgrade? Or do you go through the level risking a couple more deaths, but getting some important shrine upgrades? Again, it can just kind of depend on what your goal is. Are you just trying to get to the boss as soon as fast as possible? Or are you trying to get a really good run with really good upgrades, get a bunch of XP? In which case, you're probably not going to take too many shortcuts and try and get to all the shrines you can. My advice would be to not shortcut the squats or the club on any given run or really at any point. Both of these levels are relatively manageable. Once you figure out a strategy for Sean where you don't die 20 times, you're going to find that you're able to manage these two levels quite well. And that will mean that you're getting to all the shrines here and getting some really critical upgrades. All right, I've talked quite a bit about shrine upgrades, so let's finally get to the point where we talk about what are the all of the different shrine upgrades and which are the best. So first, remember, for each category of shrine upgrade, there are points where you may not be able to buy them either because you don't have enough XP or high enough score or because you're too old. So just keep that in mind. The first upgrade is structure reserve. This just means um, if you upgrade here, you'll be able to guard and block more moves before your structure breaks and you're vulnerable as we move into the next one you'll note that some of these have one two or three asterisks one is good three is essential no asterisk means i don't typically invest in it 
The second one is the amount of health you regain on takedowns. The only reason this has two and not three is because it's not a ton more health that you regain when you upgrade this. Next is weapon durability. This also has a two just because weapons are so important. But again, it's not like they last an extremely long amount of time when you upgrade here. Next is structure regain. I almost never invest in this. I don't invest in structure that much because I'm just doing a lot of avoiding. Next is focus regain, which I really like, particularly for Sean and other bosses, because you're just going to get more focus faster to then be able to use and create vulnerability windows on bosses. On to parry impact. I almost never invest in this because it's so freaking expensive and because parries are like deflections or perfect parries are actually pretty hard to time and you don't get them a ton so i don't invest a lot in that next is focus reserve this is probably what i do later by like late in the museum because more focus will help with some bosses last is weapon proficiency this is my number one top thing i invest in because weapons do so much damage and they're so great so I recommend that one a lot. Last is death counter, which I put one star next to because once you get to some bosses, your death counter is going to be quite high. So the 1000 XP investment is worth it to go from, say, eight death meter to a zero in order to beat that boss because you're probably going to die a lot against certain bosses. Right on to the skill tree. So you can uh, upgrade in your skills in three places. So your skill tree can be accessed in three different places. Of course, the... One of the main places is your actual skill tree and kind of your home base. Uh, the next is when you die. So every time you die, you'll have an opportunity to upgrade skills on your skill tree. This is really important because you might need a specific skill you feel like, or to make sure you just use all of your XP before you fully you die. The, the sort of subtly, not too subtly sneaky place you can also upgrade your skill tree is at the shrine by pressing square on PlayStation 5. It's displayed clearly, but I still have missed it a couple times. All right, let's cruise through my favorite skills. Again, we're gonna kind of go through zero asterisks, meaning I don't really worry about it till later on, all the way up to three asterisks, which mean I care about it a lot, invest in it early. Don't forget that different sort of clumps of skills you won't be able to access once you, once you hurt a certain age. So just be mindful of that. So the first one is 360 swing focus. I don't invest much in the focuses, foci, uh, because I just use the ones that are given to you. So same with strong sweep focus. I did get this relatively early, but you don't need it. Snap kick is kind of nice. It does a semi-stun. I'll talk about that later. Spin hook kick is essential. I found that basically after any two moves, so any strong or light attack, if you give a little pause, you'll be able to do a spin hook kick or a roundhouse, and this knocks people out. And the key to critical skills are the ones that fully stun or knock guys to the ground, and spin hook kick does that and does it pretty quickly. Next is charge back fist. I like this one. It has two because while you're working on one guy, you're going to see other guys come up on you. You can charge your back fist, and it just gives you some dynamic abilities to switch directions and get guys behind you so love charge back fist next is face smash again i didn't focus too much on the focuses ones uh so i didn't invest in this until quite later on and it costs two bars so i typically only have one bar till pretty late in the hideout games Next is Weapon Catch. This is worth it because essentially when you get to the museum boss, you're going to really want a Weapon Catch. Next is Pushback Cancel. I actually find this doesn't work too great. You get pushback quite far. It's great in theory, but I still don't get to cancel it as early as I'd like. Ground Counter is great, particularly against Sean. So again, it has one star because it's not that important, but it's really great against Sean, the boss of the club. Next, Environment Mastery. This is just critical. Again, it knocks people to the ground, knocks them to the ground quickly, and that's essential for skills. Next is Double Palm Focus. Again, I didn't invest too much in the ones that cost two bars. Let me know if you don't think this is a great strategy in the comments, because I can definitely hear that. Next is Flowing Claw. This one has two stars because it's one quick movement of the buttons, and you're able to do a spin kick that brings people to the ground, which I love. So definitely invest in that one. It has two asterisks. Next is Chasing Strikes. Yeah, I just didn't find this particularly useful. Uh, same with Crooked Foot. These ones that do knock people to the ground, but it's not as quick or as easy as some of the others. Duck Strike does kind of a semi-stun and does it very quickly, which I really like. So you're able to get this attack in 
very quick in the middle of a combo that semi stuns guys so you can finish them or move on to the next guy vertical strikes focus again just didn't really invest in these especially ones that take two bars next has one star it's invert throw i like this because it's just good to be able to move people around and keep them in front of you next is hook intercept again it's very easy to do and does a semi stun and you can also charge it while you're in guard or blocking so as soon as you see a moment you can get the hook in there and intercept their combo which i really like next chasing trip kick this is pretty good. I mean, again, you push someone back, it can be nice to take them down pretty quickly. I just don't always think of it, and there are quicker and easier ways to get people to the ground. Next is Crotch Punch. I really like this one because A, it's freaking hilarious, and B, because it does semi-stun people with one move. It interrupts combos, and I really like that. Thigh Cut Focus, I imagine because this is three bars, it does a lot of damage, but I didn't invest in Foci. Raining Strikes, this is good because you can do it pretty quick. It is a bit of a semi-stun. It's just not as effective as other semi-stun moves. Next is Slide Kick, arguably the most essential, the most versatile. Often it's almost, it's very frequently effective, even some, sometimes effective against bosses. So Slide Kick is arguably the number one thing worth investing in, in my opinion, because it's so great and versatile. Next has two stars. This is Weapon Mastery. This just lets you get to use your weapon until it breaks completely, which is worth investing in because weapons do so much damage. So that's why it has two asterisks. And those are the shrine and skill tree investments that I think you should make. But hit me up in the comments if you disagree, because I do think there's some style and opinion that can definitely play into this. They all are there for a reason. And that's really it for this video. Thanks for watching. Moving right along to the look good guide. This is really just settings that I think make the gum game more immersive and fun and go in a little overview of the photo mode. So I love turning the HUD off. If you watch any of my videos, you know I turn the HUD off um, for combat because it's so immersive and more fun, more intense. The, it feels like the stakes are higher too. So you can see some combat in here where the HUD is off. And again, I just think visually, um, and in terms of just paying attention and being dynamic, you really get to tune in. You really are going to need to listen for takedown chimes. There it was. I think you probably are able to hurry, hear it because you won't get that square triangle on PS5 indicator that is time for a takedown. So you really got to listen for that chime. So getting rid of the HUD will make you look good. And I'm going to go over the photo mode, which can be accessed by pressing down on the D-pad on PS5 to talk more about yeah just kind of appreciating the aesthetics of this game it is very beautiful some scenes you know the museum is like drop dead amazing sometimes i uh i take most of my photos there and post them on twitter you can find me at midnight lights um check it out and so yeah with photo mode you have options to change the filter to move around you can also put your uh player in different positions to help take the picture you can mess with fog and exposure there's actually quite a bit of things you can do you to make it to make photo mode work for you you also can add like the brand of the game and things like that if that's what you're into um, aspect ratio if you want to post it uh, better for instagram whatever it is and i'll show you a couple pictures i took but the thing i want to highlight most about photo mode is just taking the opportunity to appreciate the game and what the developers make because there's so much detail that are about the aesthetics it's worth taking a little time to check out for watching this video on the look good guide working with your hud settings and photo mode i hope you enjoyed it and i will see you for the next one our next video focuses on combat. This is where we move into the combat side of our combat and survival guide. And this is all about defense, which I will say fundamentally is critical to being able to beat this game, particularly bosses. So with that, the number one way to be great at defense, blocking, avoiding, etc., is to scout. <laughs> so what I mean by this is as you go through levels, focus on, okay, what kind of enemy, there are about eight different kinds, maybe closer to 10 different kinds of fighters. So every time you're fighting them, you should be scouting, getting their timing down. When's the best, what's the best move and when's the best time to do that avoid that opens up a vulnerability window for you to punish them. 
So just remember, early on, you should be spending a lot of time scouting, not worrying too much about dying or progressing. The goal here is to figure out how to beat each kind of enemy, and that is the number one thing I can tell you that will help you with your defense and surviving and combat in general, is knowing your enemy inside and out. Really important too to understand how structure works when it comes to defense. So structure is the bar at the bottom of your screen that when it gets maxed out, you're vulnerable to attack. You can't defend yourself. Now, what increases or maxes your structure out and builds it towards breaking are devastating attacks and different kinds of attacks while you're in guard or blocking with L1 on PS5. Those devastating attacks when their feet and fists are light up, those can have a huge impact and weaken your structure quite a bit. And yes, you are vulnerable when it breaks. So when it maxes out, you're likely to fall down or be disoriented and they're gonna do a lot of damage. You can upgrade your structure at a shrine. I don't typically encourage it because mostly what you're gonna do when listening to my tips and most other people's as well is avoiding. So you're just gonna not be in guard, not blocking. Oftentimes you're gonna be avoiding attacks and that's best for preventing structure from getting too high or breaking. A couple other quick things about structure, y'all, is one, a bottle thrown to your face is gonna instantly break your structure and leave you vulnerable. So good to get that skill that lets you catch bottles um, or otherwise just press R2 and dodge. Next is running and attacking doesn't decrease your structure. So you can run away. This is particularly important with the museum boss. Um, your structure is not gonna go down. So you need to kind of be still or avoiding for your structure to go down. Next, we're gonna talk about the different ways you can defend yourself and when are they good for. So number one is blocking. There are some really good reasons to block, but just remember that blocking is gonna be the number one thing that weakens your structure and eventually breaks your structure. But blocking is just holding L1 or guard on the PS5 and the strikes landing, but not doing damage. But typically, again, your structure is gonna weaken and break pretty quickly if you're relying on this. So if that's the case, when is it good to block? So I do a lot of blocking when I'm scouting, when I'm studying a fighter for the first time, trying to figure out their moves, because I know my structure is gonna break, but they're not just gonna do so much damage. I'm not as vulnerable if I'm trying to do a, a parry or deflect or avoiding, which we'll talk about. So really good to just hold that L1 to learn their moves without dying very very quickly i also really like to block if it's an unfamiliar attack like i'm playing this person this fighter for like the sixth time and here's this attack i don't think i've seen before i just hold l1 and don't let go till it's over next is sweeps you probably know by now that sweeps from enemies are really hard to predict find see and they almost always knock you on your butt but if you're holding l1 even a sweep isn't going to knock you down. So good to hold L1, particularly with those enemies that sweep a lot and you're not sure what to do. It's also really good to block the first few moves of a combo while you set up an avoid or perfect parry. So you can see in the next couple videos that the fighter I'm up against, they kind of have these patterns and it can be a little tougher to get the avoids or perfect parries early on, but they always finish with a particular move that's a lot easier to perfect parry. So I'll block the first two or three moves of the combo I know from the fighter, and then I know that last move, there's a little bit of a delay. And so I'm just blocking until that last move, and then I'll do the avoid or perfect parry to set up that window of vulnerability where I can punish them. The next way to effectively defend yourself is to deflect or perfect parry. The game calls it calls it deflect, but I know a lot of other games call it the perfect parry. This is when you hit L1 at just the right minute to open up that vulnerability window where you can punish them. I will say I don't love the perfect parry. This game, of a lot of games, I found is hardest to get the right timing. It happens sort of organically when I'm in big groups, but I actually find this timing to get tough. So that's why I prefer avoiding or blocking until a perfect avoid, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
So the question then becomes, when is deflect best? Is it ever good to use since the timing's so tough and if you miss the timing, you're, you're gonna get punished? Well, big groups, I think you'll find that you're sort of doing this quite organically. And if you mess it up a little bit, you're not up against the toughest guys who do the most damage. So you're just gonna take maybe a shot or two. So big groups are good. Also, when you see the attack coming from a million miles away, so you could see that guy, I saw him sneaking up on me. They typically have a move where they really wind up like that. Sometimes you can perfect parry those, or when you just know the pattern really, really well. So next is that, yeah, block until the perfect opportunity to deflect. So you're just going to hold L1 until that move is coming where you really have the timing down. And then you're gonna let go of L1 and tap it really quickly. So when you know an, uh, an enemy really well and you know their combos, you're gonna find there's a move that you have the timing just right to deflect slash perfect parry. Next, I wanna talk about the mother of all and the best of all defensive strategies, which is avoiding, or defensive techniques really, which is holding the guard button L1 and just moving the joystick um, out of the way of the attack. So I'm gonna talk more about how to do that, but. You're, and you'll get so good at this once you, as you get better at facing Sean, but it really is the best and go-to for a couple reasons. One is because you have to be good, but not perfect. So your timing doesn't have to be as good as a deflection slash perfect parry, which is really nice. There are a couple moves like when these big guys try and pick you up or takedowns like that, where you do have to be timed right and some bosses need to be timed quite right. But I just find that avoiding is pretty forgiving as it opens up those vulnerability windows. So yeah, that's why it's my go-to. It also doesn't increase structure if you're doing it right. And if you mess up, you're just gonna be in guard or, or blocking anyway with L1. So you're just not gonna take a lot of damage. Your structure's not gonna break very easily. It really is the best way to go. So there is avoiding high and low, and there is avoiding side to side. Now this is a little confusing, so stick with me. It's not confusing to do, it's just confusing to describe. So when you avoid high, I mean that there's a high attack coming. There's an attack coming towards your head. So when that happens, you're holding L1 and pressing down to duck. So the way I like to think of it is I'm either ducking by pressing down or picking my leg up to avoid a sweep by flicking the joystick up. So down to duck, up to like lift your leg and prevent a sweep. So that's avoiding high and low. Brings us to avoiding side to side. So this would be attacks that are sort of coming vertically or up and down on you. And you're gonna be holding L1 or the guard button and moving side to side as those very vertical sort of straightforward up and down attacks come that can it all be confused for high and low attacks. So again, you kind of have these horizontal attacks you're doing up and down and vertical attacks you're doing side to side. Important point here is like I said, this is avoiding is pretty forgiving. Sometimes I find that if it's not a sweep attack, if I'm just ducking, I'll get a lot of sort of perfect avoids, which is when you avoid typically the last move in a combo and a vulnerability opens up where you can punish them. So like I said, it's just kind of forgiving. So I do a lot of ducking, a little side to side, and then if I see a sweep coming a mile away, I'll uh, lift my leg up or L1 and up. But again, if you're guarding and not letting go of that L1 button while you're doing this, even if you mess it up, you're still not likely to take a lot of damage. I've referred to these vulnerability windows, which is just what I call them, which is when you avoid at the right time, typically at the end of a combo or with a big devastating move coming your way, you're gonna open up, you're gonna sort of slow down time and notice that these windows open up where your the fighter you're up against is not um, guarding or protecting, or they're vulnerable. You just get to take them down, get a couple moves in or a combo. So the way you do this, and the best way to do this again, number one, know thy enemy, know their patterns, their combos, so you can figure out what combo this is pretty quickly and know that when that last move is coming, if you just have to get the avoid pretty good, and then that window will open up and you'll be able to punish them. Sometimes you can avoid and punish mid combo, but I find it's easier to just wait until that last move, typically a devastating move, and avoid, open up that vulnerable vulnerability window and punish them. The next defensive move that definitely has its place is dodge or R2. 
on the PS5. This is really kind of a scoot. It's just sort of scooting out, scooting away, making space, and making space is really important. So what is dodge good for? And if you hold R2, it's run. Uh, dodge and running is good to get away for structure. So you run, make a little space. Remember your structure doesn't go away or, or rebuild basically. When you're running, you just need to run far enough away to give yourself a little break and let your structure regain. It's also good for making space to re-engage, particularly as you're scouting an enemy. Just kind of like making some space between you and them so you're not, you don't have your back up against the wall. They're not like right on top of you and you're able to see the attack from a, with a little bit of space and just give your room oh, yourself a little room for a breather so that you can um, get back into rhythm, get back of the flow of the combat and yeah, so just making space. Now let's talk about getting up and recovering. So when your structure breaks or when they land a devastating blow, you're going to need to recover and get up as fast as possible. It's very important to not take further damage. So the best way to do it, or what I should say is the best way early on and really kind of one of the only ways is to press R2 to roll away. So when you get knocked down, you just press R2 and a direction and you'll roll away. And this is important against the enemies that kind of pound or ground and pound after they knock you down, like Sean and some of those big guys. Next is ground counter. This is where you press L1 after you've been knocked to the ground. And I'll tell you, this doesn't work very often with most enemies, but man, does it work with Sean. He has that really bad sweep move in the second phase that he has and you can ground counter him almost every time with that. Another way to recover that I haven't quite perfected is the pushback cancel. This is where you kind of get kicked back or pushed back and you press L1. I just find that this move actually doesn't cancel the pushback soon enough, so it's not my favorite. Now, sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Sometimes I think about what you've what I've gone through so far as just preventing damage and being really good at avoiding and parrying, which is great, but sometimes you just need to interrupt um, damage by doing damage to them. And I sort of think of this as strike first, strike hard, He's no mercy, me. which if you watch Karate Kid is Cobra so. Kai's motto. Um, and everything up to this point has been more Miyagi-Do. But either way, not super important. What is important is you can absolutely interrupt combos, get the jump on guys, um, and prevent damage by attacking. So you'll see some combos on your screen where they're coming at me and I'm using a weapon or a light attack to interrupt that combo while it's coming. So again, it's just a way to be mindful that particularly with big groups or some enemies, you can. there are particular points where you can kind of interrupt their combo. So it can be really good to do some avoiding, yes, but when you see their attack coming, like you can see that charge back fist, like those can really help with defense as well because you're on the attack, you're doing damage, and of course the best defense is when everyone's taken down and you're not doing any more damage. So offense can help with defense. When it comes to this idea of offense is the best defense in some instances, Another aspect of this is being able to create space and time. So when you're defending, you've got a lot of guys coming at you. It's good to know how to sweep, how to do these stuns or semi-stuns. And I talk more about that in the next video. But you want to be able to identify those moves that push guys back, that sweep them, that get them out of your hair for a couple seconds so you can focus and take down another guy and then refocus on them. So make sure to get sweep stuns and pushbacks down. Also note that during a takedown, you're invulnerable, or I've seen maybe once or twice where I've got hit during a takedown, but generally, when you're doing a takedown, you're not gonna take damage. So if there's a lot of guys attacking you at once and you're able to squeak in a takedown, that will give you a little bit of a break. This, and this really brings me to the tip I have with defense, which is practice patience, which is the my word for the combination of creating space so that you can reset and get in your rhythm, but also patience where you're good at avoid and blocking to the point where, I mean, this is just the opposite of button mashing. You're scouting your enemies, you're creating space, and you're being patient to get the attacks in when they make most sense. So practice this patience. Again, this is gonna come with more runs, more time, more um, scouting of enemies. So let's talk now about guarding against weapons, which isn't terribly different from you know, general avoiding guard strategy, which I've outlined so far, but weapons do do a lot of damage to you. So you wanna be really effective at guarding against them. And the number, way one, the number one way to do that is disarming. 
um, to get that weapon out of their hands so that you can then take them on while with their own weapon or the weapon you have. So some ways to disarm are sweep. Sweep is probably the easiest way to disarm, particularly against just sort of those average, um, most common guys um, who are pretty vulnerable to sweeps, but that will disarm them. But so will, so does pushing them back and kicking them back. So uh, that's down up square that will disarm them as well. So will any roundhouse or hook kick. Those all disarm enemies. Until you get to that disarm place or as you're working up to the best moment to disarm them, avoiding is still your best bet. It's just the number one go-to, like I said. So whether they have a knife, they have a um, staff, whatever it is, if you're, the better you are at avoiding, the better you are at defending against anyone, including fighters with weapons. As far as I can still tell except for the boss in the museum you can still block weapons even knives and blades it will come at a big cost to your structure but it won't do damage again the exception to this is the boss at the museum all right moving on to our next and very important tips are uh, defending against bosses bosses which has been a huge issue for everyone I know like the YouTube videos on how to beat Sean are are huge and I'll have my own tutorial soon but let's go over some ways to defend against bosses so my number one defense tip still applies you should scout do a lot of scouting go up against the boss a lot um, typically I say don't take shortcuts like get the XP from going through it but Go against the boss a number of times and be okay with dying. The game is designed for you to die quite a bit. Um, and if you go in knowing that's going to happen and with the goal of just being like, hey, I'm going to really work hard to understand this guy's moves so that I can get the better of him, dying won't be quite as devastating, frustrating, or anger inducing. So you're going in trying to master the avoid and recognize the pattern so you can avoid at just the right moment on these predictable patterns, open up that vulnerability window and then punish them. Generally, I would say another tip is to be defense oriented against bosses. If it's a big group or normal gods, I'm very aggressive, but with bosses, I'm very defensive. Like I'm very much trying to find the pattern I like that's the best to get that perfect avoid and open up that window. So. Go into bosses, whether you're scouting or trying to uh, knock them out and beat them with this idea that I'm going to be defense and patient oriented and wait for that opportunity to counter and punish. Naturally, with that last tip, we kind of arrive at this place of asking the question of generally, should I be more defensive in my approach to Stifu or should I be more aggressive? Now, the number one response to this is don't button mash. I know that's like a well-documented tip with this game. But button mashing is going to kill you so fast. You need to get good at knowing the moves and being very good with your attacks and your defense. So my biggest tip here is that, again, with bosses, you want to be defensive. You want to go in, um, learn their moves, and be really good at identifying the patterns to then attack um, when you do that perfect avoid. But with big groups, you want to be aggressive. You want to kind of be on the front foot. You want to try and interrupt their combos by attacking. This is the strike hard, strike strike first, strike hard, no mercy with big groups because if you're very defensive, your structure is going to build up really quick and then you're going to be really vulnerable. So with bosses, I would say defensive, big groups, aggressive. And then with smaller groups or mini bosses, you can kind of flow in between. Um, but that's generally my tip around whether or not you should be more defensive or aggressive. And that wraps up our section on defense, y'all. If you've made it this far, good for you. And we're gonna move on to attacking after this, but I hope you liked the video. Give that thumbs up and subscribe, and I'll see you for the next section. Let's get into our combat guide. Next section, which is all about attacking strategy and the best attacking moves and skills for you to be able to, yeah, live into that aggressive side of Sifu. So the number one tip here for attacking or the number one strategy point is to learn the combos and really experiment and play. This is the most fun part of the game. The attacking side of it, the doing damage side is the most fun and most satisfying more than any aspect of defense in my opinion. So having a great combo, getting a great attack, knocking a guy on his ass, 
those are the things that make this game very rewarding. So knowing how to do that and experimenting is some of the most fun I've had with the game. So that's my number one tip, it helps. Moving on to the next tip are just knowing that weapons are clutch. This is pretty well documented in other guides, but I just want to reinforce it. Weapons do a lot more damage. I tried early on to just be like, I'm not even going to use weapons. Nope, they are critical, in my opinion, to being able to beat any given hideout. So find them, use them, know the locations, and bring them from one section to the next. Like, go through a door or into your next section with a weapon in your hand, even if it's a bottle. It just goes such a long way. You can get an extra knockout a lot quicker or just do more damage progressively if you're bringing weapons with you. The next piece that is going to take a minute to describe is these stuns half stuns and sweeps that when done effectively are going to create space for you to reorient or get your rhythm back or vulnerability windows in which you can punish people so full stuns are moves that get guys to like crouch over like this or kick them back half stuns are moves that like a crotch punch like that where you don't stun them for very long but it does open up a brief window so crotch punches are the best to do that in my opinion and then of course sweeps are one of the number one easiest and best ways to um, create space and some vulnerability for you to do those ground and pounds Let's move on now to the best moves, the moves that I think are critical to attacking. And that starts with a sweep, which is just up down triangle on PlayStation. It's a lot of typical guys are very prone to it. The next is a palm strike that's down up square. That also, again, knocks them back, gives you a little space and makes it easier for you to go get them down. You can sweep them when you go get them. Um, but palm strikes and sweeps are absolutely massive. So when you do get those sweeps too, those successful sweeps, if you hold circle, you can do a beat down. So I call this the sweep down, beat down. It's very effective, does a good amount of damage. Anytime you do a sweep, there typically is that vulnerability window to hold circle and do a beat down. And this is great because if the sweep is something you do at the end of a combo, this just extends your combo. So get really good at that sweep down, beat down. All right, so here are my three go-to combos. These are the things that typically I think work well against mini bosses and bosses and some of those guys that like turn into flaming guys. So the number one is the two strike sweep down beat down. This is really when there's a vulnerability window just doing any combo of strong and light attacks and then following it up with down up triangle on PlayStation 5 to create a window of vulnerability and keep your combo going with a sweep down beat down next is light hard 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 so when there's a vulnerability this works so well against the botanist when you do get that perfect avoid you're just going to do triangle or excuse me square triangle 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 very quickly and it does this combo that knocks them to the ground which again will create an opportunity for you to do a beat down Next is the hook kick. Maybe it's the roundhouse kick. I'm not quite sure what allows me to do this, but it's very effective. This is any combination of a light heavy attack. So square, triangle, triangle, square, triangle, triangle, whatever. And then just a split second delay and pressing triangle again, then does this roundhouse or hook kick. And then you can follow that up with a beat down too. Some of the other best attacks are, of course, takedowns. I mean, that's the most obvious square triangle on PlayStation 5. Um, it gives you health. It's very important. But so is the directional throw. So directional throw is not only fun because you can throw guys off uh, the heights here, like you can see, but also to throw them into the walls or just make space and get them further away from you. So takedowns and directional throws are great. Oh, and directional throws are just square and X in the direction you want to throw someone. Also fun because you can do a directional throw against a stunned enemy near a wall or something else and it'll sort of slam them into it, which is quite satisfying. We're going to go into attacking moves that are amazing now, which are unlockable in your skill tree, starting with slide kick, the most important unlockable move. Uh, most enemies are very vulnerable to it. You can knock someone back and follow it up with a run and slide so i just really recommend this it also again extends your combos and makes room for beatdowns spin hook kick this shows up as triangle triangle delay and then triangle but i found you can do any combination of light or heavy attack quickly wait a second and press triangle and it'll do a roundhouse or a spin hook kick 
And I just gotta say, this can knock one or two guys right on their ass. It's incredibly effective and very important to unlock. Charge Back Fist, I really like too, um, because it's very dynamic. You can be working on one guy and see another guy start creeping up on you, like in this video. And then you can just create a couple seconds to finish one guy or get back to him. So the Charge Back Fist, which is just holding triangle and then letting go in the direction you want to attack, is great. Flowing Claw is good because, once again, it creates that stun or um, knocking someone on their butt opportunity and it does it very quickly not at the end of a long combo so this is just quickly doing square to triangle and then pressing triangle for a spinning hook kick or roundhouse next is crotch punch again this is really good because it creates that semi stun which opens up a short window of vulnerability it's also great because it's hilarious and never-ending laughs um, it also tends to interrupt combos pretty effectively and you can do it pretty quick it's just two directions and then square is duck strike which is good because it creates a semi stun or a short stun and all you have to do is hold square so it's quick to do not a lot of buttons and it creates a semi stun a hook intercept i like as well because you can charge it while you're guarding and blocking and then let go when you want to um, get a quick attack in and break up a combo all right other key attacking unlocks so these are the unlocks at the skill tree and the shrine that are gonna help you with attacking. The number one thing, because once again, it gives you that great opportunity to split guys up or um, knock them on their butt is environmental mastery. This is where you can throw bottles or kick cushions or chairs and things uh, and just knock people down. It's so critical to this game, particularly in big groups. Next is weapon mastery. This is where you can um, use your weapon until it breaks completely. So anything that's going to keep a weapon in your hand for longer is going to help you do more damage. Moving on to shrine upgrades that most help with your attacking. Starting with health gained on takedowns. So you're doing takedowns anyway, so why not get more, more health from them? Takedowns are one of the most important moves in the game. Next, and arguably the most important one, certainly amongst the most important, is weapon durability, which increases your weapon's longitude before it breaks. Focus is also an important part of attacking, which I'll get into, and you're going to build a lot more focus a lot more quickly, or you're just going to build focus more quickly with the focus regain, shrine upgrade, weapon proficiency, Yep, this is the best one for offense or attacking. It just makes weapons do even more damage. They already do a lot of damage, so definitely do that. And then the death counter is another good shrine upgrade as it recounts, uh, it restarts your death counter. Next, we're gonna move to delays, direction, and rhythm. Delays, we're really just talking about putting little tiny bits of time in between your attacks to mix it up and keep the your enemies on their toes. So if you put some time in between your combos, you'll find that the enemies will like put their guard down and get ready to attack right when you go into your next um, attack. So this is really the anti-button mashing. This is being intentional and mixing it up to keep your enemies on their toes. Changing direction is also really important with big groups. You're gonna find you're attacking one way, someone sneaks up on you from behind. So you just wanna get good at avoiding and parrying from all different directions and being able to punch one way and then sweep another direction and just kind of have your head on a swivel, so to speak, because directions and being really good at anticipating attacks is both really satisfying and strategically important. As far as rhythm goes, what I'm talking about how is in each section or each fight, whether it's a boss or 20 guys, there's a kind of rhythm you can fall into where you're really in your zone of blocking and anticipating and attacking. So figuring out that rhythm is about knowing your enemies, getting into that rhythm, but also kind of resetting. When you take some damage like R2 dodging away or making some space by jumping over a planter or whatever, just to kind of get your bearings again and then get back into your rhythm so this is a little more intangible of a skill and tip but if you've been playing this game for a while you kind of know what i'm talking about so scout those enemies find those rhythms and then make a little space to get back in that rhythm you don't want to get stuck in a rut um, of just keep mashing buttons uh, find those rhythms and get back into them another attack that the game doesn't tell you about is this sneak attack which is basically as you first start a section or as you first enter into a room you can sort of 
sucker punch or sucker attack and immediately break someone's structure and go into a takedown. So take full advantage of that. Last section, we talked about defense and how to keep our structure from breaking. But now let's talk about how enemy structure works and how to break it. So the things that weaken or build towards breaking enemy structure is damaging them. And of course, the bigger the attack that they block, the more structure you're going to weaken. Also, deflecting or perfect parrying their attacks will um, help break their structure. Even blocking their attacks, so just holding guard L1, will also um, help break their structure. But just blocking does very little towards breaking their structure. Breaking structure is so critical for mini bosses, bosses, really any enemy, because when you fully weaken or break their structure, it leads to a takedown, which is typically the end of the mini boss fight or the end of the person you're up against or changing the boss phase. Moving right along, it's time to talk about focus and how do you use it best, when do you use it, um, and really what it is. And I'll, I really want to dedicate some time to this because I personally forget about focus sometimes, so I want to highlight it because it's a critical aspect of the game. Ways to increase your focus, which is in the bottom left hand corner where you slow down time and sort of do a special move, sending them into vulnerability, is by avoiding damage, so that's L1, and moving the left joystick and doing damage to them. Those are the things that increase your focus. It's so great for bosses, mini bosses, and big groups just to break things up, do a damage, get um, do a little bit of a stun to get a combo in. You want to use it as soon as it fills up. Don't waste time with your focus, particularly with bosses. As soon as it gets full, you really want to use it right away um, so you can start filling it back up again. More quick things on focus is the focus regain upgrade at shrines. I highly recommend it hastens how quickly you regain focus so you can then deploy it. You can upgrade to better focus attacks in the skill tree. I honestly, I don't do this. I find the strong sweep, which is cheap, and the punch to the eyeballs to be plenty sufficient for um, focus, for what I use focus for. Moving on to attack strategies for bosses and, and what's the best way to approach attacking bosses. So at this point, it's hopefully ingrained. The best thing you can do to figure out how, when to attack, what attacks are best, are to scout, experiment, practice, and probably die a lot. Just go up against the boss a lot of times to scout out their moves and what's the best attacks to take them down. When you're doing that, you want to spot their patterns, particularly the ones that you can predict and figure out the best in terms of being able to avoid or perfect parry slash deflect those and then punish them. So. You want to spot the patterns, avoid probably the last move in a combo, and then punish. Also, again, use your focus as soon as possible, as soon as it's full. It's going to open up an opportunity for you to sweep down, beat down, or to get another combo in, um, and then start filling up your focus meter right away. Also, just use weapons, shrines, and tree upgrades. You really want to bring weapons to you with any boss. Um, it's going to go such a long way in quicken up uh, knocking them out. And use shrine and tree upgrades to make sure your weapons are good so they last in those fights. My last little tip is if you press right on the D-pad, um, you can taunt your enemies, which is always a little fun. So that's it. That's everything. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this massive guide um, and all of the videos that are in it. Take care and check me out on Twitter and Instagram. And just remember, as soon as I start making a single dime from my YouTube videos, 50% of what I make will go to a charity that we choose as a subscriber community. So all the more reason to spread the word, like, and subscribe.